Good evening. I'm Michael Bess. I'm in the history department here at Vanderbilt. Um, I hope you've enjoyed your stay here in Nashville, a city that um, likes to refer to itself as the Athens of the South. I was in the local airport recently with my 16-year-old son, um, and uh, we heard the loudspeaker resorting to this trope, welcome to Nashville, the Athens of the South. So I turned to my son uh, and said, well, what does that make Athens, Georgia? And he replied, the Nashville of the South. <laughs> On behalf of the Society for French Historical Studies, I'd like to recognize the generous support of the Vanderbilt University Provost's Office, the College of Arts and Science, many departments and programs in helping to support this conference and this evening's banquet. I also ask you to join me in extending a resounding thank you to the persons who put so much tireless work into organizing and running this conference, Katie Crawford and Lauren Clay. ably assisted by Jennifer Dodd. You started clapping before I could add the third person. <laughs> it's my pleasure this evening to introduce our banquet speaker, Mary Louise Roberts. Professor Roberts is the Planert Bascom Professor of History at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she also holds the Wharf Distinguished Lucie Aubrac Chair. Professor Roberts is the author of four books, Civilization Without Sexes, Reconstructing Gender in Postwar France, 1917 to 1927, uh, which won the Joan Kelly Prize from the AHA. Disruptive Acts, The New Woman in Fin de Siècle France, published in 2002. What Soldiers Do, Sex and the American GI in World War II France, 1944 to 1946 published in 2013. And most recently, D-Day Through French Eyes, Memoirs of Normandy, 1944, published in 2014. She's been the recipient of numerous awards and fellowships, among them a Guggenheim in 2007, and a Chancellor's Distinguished Teaching Award at the University of Wisconsin in 2008. Her book, What Soldiers Do, generated a great deal of discussion as soon as it was published, from the New York Times to the Los Angeles Times, from NPR to HNET. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the book has been the subject of many articles, reviews, roundtables. It's also generated a great deal of admiration. It won the George Lewis Beer Prize of the uh, AHA and the Gilbert Chouinard Prize from our very own Society for French Historical Studies. It also inspired a French documentary film, Le Repos des Guerriers, which was released last year. Professor Roberts' talk this evening is entitled Le Spectacle de la Résistante, Female Dress and Gender Transformation. Professor Roberts. Thank you very much, first to Michael, um, Michael Bess, for a lovely introduction. I too personally just want to thank uh, Katie uh, and Lauren for such an amazing conference. It's just been spectacular. Um, uh, and um, I'm so honored to have this opportunity to be here. Thank you so much. I'd also like to thank um, all my friends who are here. Uh, and. Uh, how much I uh, cherish coming here and celebrating uh, my friendships with people who I've known for 30, 40 years. Uh, we're all sort of locked in mutual semi-blackmail um, <laughs> because we did so many outrageous things in Paris uh, when we were in our 20s and 30s and now we just keep our secrets like good family. 
Uh, and uh, it's amazing to grow older with them. You know, now suddenly we're talking about Lipitor uh, and uh, cataract surgery and hip replacement, uh, which makes them all the more precious uh, to me. And I want to give particular thanks uh, to those friends who came despite the fact that they never ever go to banquets and they've never ever done it, or those who absolutely hate catering food or hotel food, or those who are missing Crystal Gale at the Grand Old Opry. I'm very sorry about that. I really appreciate your presence here. Okay, and finally, I, most importantly, I want to thank my students uh, and uh, former and present uh, students. They are uh, taking time to come here tonight. I so appreciate they are the center of my intellectual life. Uh, much of what you're going to hear has to do with um, teasing out ideas with them. I am so lucky to have them in my life. Thank you. Okay. In 1944, 18-year-old résistant Simon Seguin became a darling of the liberation press. A member of the FTP resistance, Seguin helped capture 25 POWs and shot and killed two Germans in the Paris liberation. Why did she become so popular? By the sheer fact of her gender, Seguin symbolized the unprompted heroism of the August liberation. Her presence implied that despite their lack of military training, even women had joined the fight. In fact, Seguin's presence should not have been surprising, given that women formed a considerable presence in all resistance networks. Nevertheless, she became a proud allegory of a spontaneous fighting France. Seguin also represents what I call le spectacle de la résistance, a novel way of performing the female body for the French public. At first glance, her self-presentation as a woman with a gun signals the disruptive effects of the war on gender norms. The unwritten but deeply seated rule of war that it is fought for women, not by women, has apparently been broken. Seguin's presence signals the failure of French men to protect their homes and their women. In that sense, her spectacle was a source of humiliation as well as pride. In other words, she had become a man in the shameful absence of men. Or had she? A second glance at Seguin's embodiment of a combat role complicates such a conclusion. In fact, her appearance defies easy gender assignment. The shorts were short and accentuated her tanned, lean legs. Her blouses were fashionable, her hat was dashing, and her waist decorated with either a coquettish bow or a gallant red sash. The most subversive element of this spectacle lay not in the fact that Seguin sported a machine gun, but that she did so with unmistakable panache. Seguin used her clothes to present as female, even as the machine gun signaled a shift in conventional identifications of gender. Like other résistantes, she was left to invent her own visual appearance. As a story in Elisabeth Terrenois has put it, les résistantes étaient combattants sans uniforme. Even in the summer of 1944, male partisans forbade their female comrades from dressing in uniforms available in the Allied army. We now understand that prohibition as an attempt to deny women the status of warriors. Unable to wear uniforms, résistants were left to their own devices in asserting their status as fighters. Seguin's spectacle demonstrates a new impudence in partisan dress, one which celebrates the liberation. During the occupation, résistants engaged in clandestine activities and could hardly afford to announce their politics through their clothing. By contrast, Seguin combines blue shorts and blouse with a bright red Republican sash in order to proclaim her tricolor loyalties. 
Crucially, her outfit resembled that of an 18th century revolutionary sans culotte. In this way, she aligned herself with the French revolutionary tradition, borrowing its legitimacy for her own actions. She, prevents a subver she presents a subversive spectacle of transformed femininity at once playful and patriotic, coquettish and serious. Tonight, I follow Seguin's lead in exploring what partisans wore during their years in the resistance. In narrating stories of resistance, historians have rightly argued for their inclusion in the historical record. We have now a rich, detailed record of the many women who risked their lives in acts of sabotage and rescue. We also now appreciate the work of the so-called anonymous résistantes, women who opened their homes to partisans, fed and housed them, and otherwise assured their safety. My approach revisits such stories differently. I look at them not only as narratives worthy of our recognition, but as a set of embodied experiences. My starting point is the belief that war for these women was a particular somatic way of knowing, a set of corporeal reflexes, habits, sensations, and practices which constitute the somatic experience of war. It was as bodies that Résistance came to know the war's regime of sensations, its hardships, and its dangers. It was as bodies that they felt the spiteful wind or sun and heard their stomachs growling from hunger, felt their hearts thumping in fear. It was as bodies that they underwent martial training, learning how to fire a gun by pressing their thumb to the trigger. It was as tired bodies, calves aching from hours on the bicycle, head pounding from waves of stress, that these women remembered their resistance work. Most importantly for me tonight, it was as clothed bodies that these women hid documents, carried weapons, and deployed seduction to evade German arrest. How the résistance chose to clothe their bodies determined their public presentation, not only of their body, but also of their self. Sometimes that self-staging signaled changes in identity. Sometimes it did not. But the clothed body was always central to how Résistante viewed herself as a presence in the world. How she dressed her body and how she perceived that dress became crucial to how she came to know herself as a warrior. In focusing on dress, I acknowledge the exceptionally strong links in modern France between female bodies and clothing, femininity, and fashion. Even in the difficult circumstances of war, the Résistance shared a persistent concern with personal aesthetics. In their memoirs, they inventory the clothes they wore and fantasize about the clothes they would have liked to wear. Evelyne Soulereau, for example, remembers that when she joined the Maquis, she took a skirt made from a bread spread, a blouse, sandals, and one pair of underwear. That was all she wore for two months. My talk is grounded in this question. Would a male partisan remember such a list of clothing? <laughs> in the absence of a uniform appropriate for physical activity, the résistance had to find clothes such as loose skirts or shorts in which they could move their bodies. Résistance Cécile Zulias Romagon complained about the extremely narrow skirts in fashion. How could I make to jump as hampered as I am? But as we shall see, our traditional binaries as fashion historians, ones I've used myself, which are free movement versus constriction, liberation versus repression, cannot do justice to the complex range of meaning suggested by these women's clothing and its relationship to their bodies. Part one. To appreciate dress in this way, we must begin by reviewing the links between fashion and femininity before the war. It is a truism that fashion played a unique role in French cultural life during the interwar era. Among other things, it signified French cultural preeminence. 
what one war in Paris dictated to a great extent what one war throughout Europe and the world. Nevertheless, the meaning of fashion changed dramatically at the beginning of the war. Dress, like body weight, became a measure of collaboration with the occupying powers. Women who continued to wear fashionable clothes raised suspicions, either because they were buying on the black market or because they were somehow favorably connected to German authorities. More austere dress signaled righteous deprivation, which earned a woman respectability. In this way, fashion became suffused in the politics of collaboration, accommodation, and resistance. Also politicized were the clothes worn by the occupiers. The French nicknamed the Germans by the color of their uniforms. They became the detestable vert de gris. Nazi women, in particular, were dismissed as frumpy sorry grises. The fact that French people focused on the German uniform to express their hostility towards their occupiers once again demonstrates the centrality of visual aesthetics and dress to French national identity. Dress provided another way of othering or distancing the enemy, helping to solidify a sometimes tenuous boundary between occupier and occupied. State restrictions played upon clothing and fabric in 1941 hardly dampened the desire for stylish dress. French women had to somehow navigate between German frumpiness and inappropriately frivolous fashion. In record numbers, they subscribed to fashion mag magazines such as Marie Claire and Le Petit Teco de la Mode. The strong links between the female body and clothing were bound by the notion of coquetry, a distinctly French trait combining stylishness and flirtation. To be a coquette was to use an elegant appearance for the purposes of seduction, to uphold, in other words, both gender and national identities. According to Dominique Veillon, French women's refusal to succumb to sartorial adversity can be interpreted as a safeguarding of identity and a way of saving appearances in a period of national shame. Coquetry was a matter of French pride. French women who entered the British Auxiliary Territorial Service, or the ATS as I call it, provide an example of such coquetry française. The ATS was the women's branch of the British Army during the war, and about 70 French women went to England to become part of the ATS as the Corps Féminin des Volontaires Françaises. Unfortunately, the word Corps Féminin became the butt of so many jokes that the organization had to be renamed Corps des Volontaires Françaises. <laughs> The name change suggests a male obsession with the female sexual body, which made military standing difficult to attain for core women. Given that fact, how these women dressed their bodies became an imperative concern. Dress came to bear the burden of establishing female military credibility. It coated the female body with a military aesthetic at once masculine and asexual. For French ATS members who still did not vote in 1941, the uniform established a civic identity. One attempt to claim such authority was made through the uniform all French Corps women were required to wear. For some members, the uniform was a consummate honor. One of them was Raymond Tessier-Jour, a native of Nouvelle Calédonie, who sailed to England in order to join de Gaulle and the ATS. She vividly remembered the first time she put on her uniform. The khaki color was not flattering on me, but I was so very proud, proud as well of the little tricolor ribbon surrounding left epaulette of my jacket, which distinguished us from the English women. Proud, finally, to write my family that evening and say to them that I was finally a soldier. Tissier Jor's joy stems from her deep investment in the uniform as conferring the status and identity of a soldier. 
The unflattering khaki troubled her identification with femininity, but these reservations were overcome by her craving for legitimacy and her love of la patrie. Like Seguin, she finds particular comfort and power in Republican imagery. Well, not everyone in the ATS was so gratified. When other French members received their uniforms, they denounced the hat as complètement horrible. <laughs> a hideous thing which only the British could fabricate. So loudly did the women complain that they were issued, and it's on the right here, a, a smart navy calot instead. So you have the, the British woman on the left and the French woman on the right. According to Jean, Jean Bauch, uh, the calot had une allure plus française. <laughs> As in the case of les souris grises, these women asserted their Frenchness by contrasting themselves, this time with the dowdy Britishness. The women also refused to wear the gas mask. Throwing it aside, they kept only the case, which they converted into a chic purse for their makeup. <laughs> Because there was not much time in the morning, this is amazing, to put on makeup, many women did it at night before they went to bed. <laughs> they also personalized their uniform by wearing their own blouses under their jacket and downing silk stockings instead of the cotton ones they were issued. Their superiors were supposed to forbid such changes, but instead looked the other way, explaining, and I quote, that feminine coquetry was innate for their compatriots. For the vast majority of résistants, however, a uniform was not possible. If uniforms bore the burden of military legitimacy for women, normal clothing enabled clandestine partisan activity. Here, a comparison with the turn of the century new woman is instructive. Like the new woman, la résistante was linked to a bicycle. In both rural and urban areas, she served as a go-between, peddling news and documents for hundreds and hundreds of kilometers sometimes. Like the new woman, La Résistante was mobile and solitary, but unlike her predecessor, the Résistante's aim was to look as discreet as possible. Uh, if the new woman straddled a bicycle in order to signal her rejection of femininity, the résistante was anxious not to spectacularize herself at all, which is why Seguin was a change uh, from the occupation. To do so meant arrest, imprisonment, and even death. At the same time, coquetry persisted, as we've already seen, uh, and also in the form of nostalgia, Quote, with my men's pants prickling my legs, lamented Elisabeth Rieu, I resembled an old sack more than the coquettish nurse I had hoped to be at 20 years old. Annie Guillenot tried to make herself, quote, as elegant as I could given my shabby wardrobe. Inversely, elegant clothing could have a normalizing effect. Marie-Madeleine Foucault cherished her stylish dresses. Foucault directed Noah's Ark, one of the most extensive underground networks in France. At one point, hiding in Spain, she was delighted to replace her threadbare clothes with a charming, in her words, a charming black silk dress, wonderful shoes, and a whole range of skirts, sweaters, and lingerie. The clothes made me, quote, feel myself again. On another occasion, she was able to make her blue suit reasonably spruce, and it, quote, gave me courage and a stout heart. For women in danger, feminine dress reopened the door to a comforting familiar. Part two. At the same time, coquetry became a strategy of war. Quote, even in this period of scarcity, she, uh, this is Foucault again, we had to force ourselves to dress elegantly or at least be correct in our behavior. Despite her fugitive status, she was one of the most wanted women in France at the time, she insisted, I kept a coquette's interest in my appearance, a fact which served me so often. Without her looks and her age, she believed, her freedom and even her life would have been lost. She kept up appearances not to win a husband, but to win a war. The difference was enormous. Femininity was not a destiny, but a disguise. 
Its purpose was not seduction, but survival. For résistance, like for cod, body type, clothing, hair, and makeup provided an innocuous presentation of femininity, which rendered certain activities possible only to them. Annie Kujo remembered leaving Grenoble on a mission when the city was completely surrounded by German police posts. No young man would be able to get beyond the police belt, she argued, but she had no problem, quote, given my innocence in the manner of a young girl. A woman is able to get through relatively unnoticed, agreed Simone Bertrand, referring to those agents who escorted Allied flowers to the south, Allied flyers to the south of France. A proper bourgeois appearance also shielded women from scrutiny, so class as well as gender. For a liaison agent, Cécile Zulia Sommagon argued, elegant apparel was equivalent to working clothes. The police, she explained, always hesitated to behave in a finicky manner towards a well-dressed woman. Just another proof, she said, that class struggle is not a figment of the imagination. <laughs> Celia Bertin swore that she was not suspected of being a terrorist in Paris simply because she never went outside without an elegant hat and high heels. Perhaps most famously, Lucille Bach used her clothes to disguise herself to the Gestapo as an upper-class woman who had been wrongfully made pregnant by a terrorist. In fact, of course, the terrorist was her husband. <laughs> Given such prejudices, Résistance learned to broker their bodily display. One day, Ozudia Somago and her mother were transporting Allied parachutes on their bicycles from the train station. When they reached the station stairs, anybody who's been in a, in a station in France knows exactly what she's talking about. You get there and there's those stairs looming and you have your staircase, you have your suitcase. When they reached the, the, the station stairs, they saw two German policemen watching them from the top. Quote, it was Mama who saved the situation, remember Zulia Homagon, pretending not to be able to carry everything up the stairs at the same time, she threw a pleading smile at the two policemen. The result, the two Nazis helped mother and daughter carry enemy parachutes up the stairs. They were not the only two Nazis to naively carry contraband for a woman. There are many cases of that. Given the new stakes of a résistance appearance, her clothing changed radically in meaning. In short, it became a weapon of war. Dress pockets and stockings hid subversive papers. Fourcade praised the merits of silk as particularly effective for hiding documents. When Azulia Homagon was once stopped by the police, her clothes were bursting with incriminating evidence. In the right pocket of my suit was a letter which I was to hand over to Hélène for Professor Marcel Prenant. Even worse, in a silky pouch between my girdle and my skin was an entire set of papers which I was to give to Marais to pass on to the regional authorities. Lise Lesev hid her most important papers in a crazy jumble in her purse. When she was arrested, the Nazis managed to miss these instead preoccupying themselves with knitting instructions for a sock heel. <laughs> Unable to read them, the Gestapo concluded that they were subversive papers written in a secret code. <laughs> Knit one, pearl one, K one, P one. Part three, transformation. As a result of training and endurance, résistance learn new skills, such as shooting a gun or sabotaging a rail line. By virtue of these new bodily competencies, as well as the dangers they took and the company they kept, résistance underwent sometimes dramatic personal transformation. For the most part, historians have understood such changes in terms of a gendered binary, in other words, as a process of masculinization. Their logic goes something like this. As a woman undertook acti activities associated with manliness, they themselves became more manly. The historiography concerning Fourcade typifies this approach. The historians first emphasized Fourcade, not other women, because she was doing so-called masculine tasks, that's a quote, by directing her network. She therefore, quote, fit in to a traditional, i.e. masculine, history of the resistance. Subsequently, gender historians protested such approach 
rightly claiming it reinforced too narrow a definition of resistance. Instead, they focused on the, quote, uniquely feminine tasks women performed underground, among them laundry and cooking. In this li literature, as Valerie Deacon has argued, Foucault, quote, no longer fit the story as a woman. So if Foucault was too male in the first work, she was not female enough in the second. I think such interpretive dilemmas result from thinking about gendered identity as a preconceived choice between male and female. That binary framework is grounded in the assumption that French sociocultural discourse defined gender as a choice between two stable oppositional meanings, as either male or female. Whether or not that binary discourse of gender did in fact exist as a stable semiotic system during the war remains an unaddressed question. And even if it was answered, women like Foucault remade themselves in ways not conforming to such a binary. As a result, we'll see, they had to endure personal incertitude and isolation. Sources of anguish would surface in their choice of dress. So uh, to explain these, these issues further, I'm going to take the sort of cases of two Breton resistants, uh, two incredible women, uh, Jean Boeck and Marie Chaming. Uh, Boeck was a Brit Breton chemist, I'll do her first, she's there, uh, who began her service in the British ATS that I just talked about, uh, and she was in the same unit as Tessier Jour. She also complained about the ugly ATS hat, uh, as well as the mandatory gas mask, which she dismissed as, quote, this horrible thing which makes us look like Martians, unquote. After several months in the ATS, Boeck entered into military training for French intelligence, or the BCRA. She was there, the only woman being trained, because she was a chemist. Uh, she was trained to use explosives, learn how to do sabotaging of rail lines, and also how to fire machine guns. Uh, she was then parachuted back into her native Brittany, and she spent the rest of the war as a liaison agent, teaching the Maquis how to handle explosives. In her memoir, Boeck describes in detail the wardrobe she prepared in London for her new mission in France including a sweater she knit herself, a skirt, and, quote, a warm coat and thick navy blue wool found on Duke Street. She rejected the purse issued by the BCRA as too noticeable and instead crocheted one, quote, with a more neutral appearance. The Boeck cared enough about her wardrobe to enumerate it many years later in her memoir demonstrates a traditionally feminine interest in dress, but at the same time, her description of her wardrobe here signals a significant transition from her ATS days. Her concerns about dress have changed from the aesthetic to the practical. Above all, she wanted to be warm, inconspicuous, and safe. That shift in turn signals another. Boex training has given her a different kind of investment in her body. The BCRA, she writes, quote, gave us confidence in our potential and a combative spirit that would be essential to us. If we think of such training as an embodied set of martial practices, Boeck has learned to make her body do new things. Moreover, she has gained the confidence to believe that her body can do such things. Her choice of clothing and returning to France suggests that new corporal investment that new corporal investment was to wage war and to survive. This transition becomes starker nine months later, when her spring weather forces her to make a cotton dress and a bonded war fiber suit. As if to justify these additions, she explains, dressing, sleeping, and eating also constitute part of the secret life. Dressing for her has now become a life function little different from sleeping or eating. When the soup becomes soiled and she is unable to find a dry cleaner, Boeck washes it by hand, rinses it under a pump, and dries it in the sun. The results were predictably terrible. But Boeck proudly claims, I didn't fret about that much. 
Bothering about clothing has become a habit too frivolous to dwell on given the demands of the war. The incident reveals how Bullock is not able to see herself. With new companies and investments, she not sees herself as defined by normative femininity. But does that mean she has now become masculine? Why Boeck dismisses her clothing, clothing as nothing more than a life-sustaining function, no evidence in her memoirs suggests that she begins to see herself as manly. In this sense, she resembles again another famous partisan, Lucie Aubrac, who roundly rejected the perception of her as a male woman and saw her actions as gender neutral, even though she wielded a gun to release her husband from prison, eight months pregnant. The meanings partisans gave to their clothes articulate changes too complex to be contained within a binary matrix. When Norman of femininity becomes unattainable for Boeck, she sees herself as not a woman rather than as a man. Changes in her bodily self-presentation, rumpled hair, sensible clothes may have the effect of making her appear manly but that does not mean she has consciously decided to take on masculine subjectivity. Having endured nine months of physical hardship, terrible fear, and horrible loss, Boeck has reduced life to its lowest denominators, eating, sleeping, and dressing. As the war has stripped away the gendered strands of her pre-war self, what remains is a stubborn inner strength intent on survival. Like Seguin, Boeck is left to her own devices in inventing her visual appearance, but unlike Seguin, Boeck's aim is anything but spectacle. She enacts a bodily instrument, excuse me, she enacts a bodily idiom which disavows attention and transforms her into a discreet and effective instrument of war. Okay, my second and last one. The case of another Brett Marie Zuston, Marie Chambon, further illustrates the inadequacies of the gendered binary framework. 20 years old when she joined the resistance, Chamming first served in Paris intelligence, fabricating documents, and then joined the Maquis in Britain. Like Boeck, she remembers exactly what she packed upon joining the Maquis in the summer of 1945. This time, it was a change of underwear, a homemade shirt, a skirt in blue cotton, and a khaki raincoat. Like Bullock again, Chamming's wardrobes demonstrates a new set of corporeal investments, the wearing of clothing to wage war and survive. But unlike Bullock, Chamming receives neither military training nor a uniform. Without military dress or martial competencies, she struggles to assert her status with her male colleagues. Not in my place, and infinitely alone, was how she describes her time in the woods. Like Boeck, once again, Chamming thinks about herself in the negative terms of indeterminacy as not in her place. Unable to conform to normative femininity in her present circumstances, and equally incapable of imagining herself as a man, she feels only excruciating isolation. As she remembers, this is my favorite, I put myself out to sea, alone in the storm. Yes, we were all alone, dispersed by the wind of war. Chamming's storm plays out between two unreachable shores, the one she has left behind and the one she cannot gain. Her fantasies revolve around past life expectations. Mes hiver were passing, irreplaceable, and sometimes a crazy desire seized me to forget everything and leave, to go to surprise parties and big nights out, to love a man and get married. Nostalgia surfaces particularly in the longing for female clothing. She remembers feeling ashamed of her khaki jacket, which made it impossible for her to faire des élégances. When a comrade gives her a blue and red silk pieces from a parachute, she stuffs what she calls these ravishing scarves under her skirt for after the war. Invited to a formal dinner, she laments her lack of a dressy dress and resigns herself to a change of shirt to look presentable. To view Chamming's struggle as a transition from female to male subjectivity, 
not only misses the complexity of the moment, but also misses the point. Since neither gender at pole is a viable option for her at that time, set adrift, forced to navigate undeterminate waters, she moves forward by embracing multiple selves at the same time. August 1944 finds her on a dangerous liaison mission in German-occupied Brittany. The same month, she falls in love with an, a with an SAS radio parachutist named George, and she agrees to marry him. Wedding plans bring on more nostalgic fantasies. I had always dreamed of the day when I would put on a dress which was unique and more beautiful than all the others. I saw myself as a princess with a pinched in waist and yards of fabric around the bottom. George would look at me like a queen. Instead, she resigns to buy a simple dress at the last moment. The events of late August elevate Chamming's storm to hurricane force. Her fantasy first, her fantasy wedding dress materializes. A lieutenant provides a white silk parachute and suggests she makes a gown. So on the left, she's just got the parachute silk around her, draping her. When she draped it around her, George explained, oh, what an incredible dress that would make for you. She thinks, pourquoi pas? Uh, and hires a seamstress to make the dress. But then tragedy strikes. Her beloved father, also in the resistance, is suddenly shot dead by the Germans. Overcome with grief, Chamming decides she must marry George right away. Given the dangers facing the couple, she reasons, she wants to bear his child as soon as possible. Quote, his race must continue, the race of men who have freely risked everything and which must not disappear, the race of my father. Chaming's reasons for marriage here signal a radical departure from what has been her conventional fantasy life. She now dreams about herself as a valiant mother of a warrior race. By displacing her grief onto motherhood, she resituates it within a partisan framework of risk and self-sacrifice. In short, she becomes a warrior mother. While Chamming has been able to meet the demands of both résistantes and fiancé throughout August, her father's death disrupts the balance she has so carefully achieved. The first convulsions surface in the matter of her wedding gown, which she decides not to wear to the wedding. She gives the news to her seamstress, who urges her to at least try it on. And so that's the picture you see on the right side. I turned around again and again in front of the mirror. No dress has ever flattered me so much, making me look thinner and taller. Her dressmaker promises to fasten the neck with a croix de Lorraine, emblem of the resistance. It's a shrewd offer, as it would transform the gown into a sort of military uniform purifying it of personal self-indulgence. But Shaming cannot be convinced to embody a bride, even a politicized one. Her ambivalence, her sense of not being in her place is more profound than ever. While George wears his uniform to the ceremony, she dons the same clothes she has worn in the woods, including the white shirt she remembered, quote, did not flatter me. Her only elegance, as she put it, were silk stockings she received as a gift. Refused a military uniform then, Shaming disavows yet another. The white gown, the white uniform, every woman wears to the altar. The rich texture of Shaming's transformation lies in its many entangled threads, normative fantasies and longings, new embodiment as a, as a maquis, faith in the partisan creed of self-sacrifice and austerity, a revisioning of motherhood, refusal of matrimonial customs. Fantasy and trauma shape her narrative more than any conscious psychic process. Furthermore, changes in Shami's bodily self-presentation neither reflect nor produce a more male woman. Gender subversion is the last thing on her mind. More than a symbol of a disavowed femininity, the unworn wedding dress is a site of mourning for her father and the ever receding shores of childhood. It signals the ruptures brought about by the war and Shaming's firm resolve to 
to live in the present rather than the past. Shamming's self-fashioning is erratic and improvisational. Like Seguin, her inability to wear a uniform either in the woods or to the altar leads her to improvise a self. Like Seguin, again, she resists our efforts to, as historians, to assign her an easy gender identity. She is neither feminine conventionally or masculine conventionally. She is simply not in her place. As such, her story demonstrates how, by tacking back and forth unproductively across a preconceived gender binary, we have neglected the uncertainty, the isolation, the agony, and the creativity grounding gender transition during the war. I would like to end here, very briefly, by saying a few words about Ravensbrück. This is the Nazi prison camp where many French résistants were sent after arrest. Here again, their clothing changed dramatically in meaning and articulated both psychic and somatic dimensions of their camp lives. Here I hope to provide one last example of the power inherent in clothing its ability to generate a complex range of meanings beyond liberation or confinement. At Ravensbrück, clothing marked the moment of entry into the camp, as well as the woman's transition from persons to prisoners. Memoirs of Ravensbrück frequently dwell on those first moments of the camp when inmates were asked to strip their garments, undergo a humiliating inspection, and be issued new clothing. Ravensbrück prisoners were at first given the striped dresses of the Nazi concentration camp. These dresses amounted to a cruel joke. At last, the résistants were receiving uniforms. Clothing became the object of the blackest humor. An inmate wrote in the Ravensbrück camp newspaper, stripes are very much the fashion this year, as is jewelry in iron wires and fillings. Coquetry was now a world away, present only in the weird farce of prison fashion. As the war went on, the clothing of the dead replaced Nazi prison garb. The French Jew, Marceline Redon Yvonne, put it this way, death regurgitated so many clothes that there were too many clothes, they reminded you of no one anymore. Clothing came to symbolize death and its anonymity, but also life in the form of warmth, protection, and survival. The Nazis used nakedness, the absence of clothes, to shame the women. But their clothing demeaned them as well. It was common for the women to wear clothes too big, too small for one's body, as well as mismatched shoes. The idea was to humiliate a woman's own sense of her body. Clothing also served as toilet paper and kotex. Giselle Guillermo remembers that when she tried to tear off part of her dress to adjust its size, the official laughed and told her not to do so as she could use the fabric for sanitary purposes. Prisoners were also forced to paint large crosses on their shirt back, sew it on their number, and red triangle. In this way, clothing produced an inmate's identity. As Guillermo put it, she became nothing more than a number on the edge of a fabric. Women, like their clothing, were reduced to stucke, effe, things. That joining of women and things, bodies and clothing, lay at the heart of these women's self-presentation in the Nazi camps. Like Boek and Shamin, Lisa Sev remembers in detail the clothing she had worn at Havensbrück. She rendered what will be tonight my last horrific inventory in the form of a photograph taken after her return. Notable here is the way in which Lesev's clothing, particularly her tights, retain the shape of her body as if to hold its memory. Lesev's body and her clothes were merged in unbearable suffering and cannot now be separated. Survivor Loridon Yvonne's also invested clothing with the memory of anguish. Shortly after her return from Auschwitz, she remembers going to her brother's wedding. Everyone present had survived the camps, but no one spoke of it. The bride wore the traditional white gown. Quote, 
The dressy clothes were nothing more than armor thrown over the clothes from the camps, she remembers. I still carry the mountains of clothes that we'd sorted through on my back and the stench of burnt flesh that would stay with me forever. After liberation, it was suffering that needed to remain undercover to shy away from spectacle. Like Le Sèvre, L'Horidon Yvons cannot lose the memory of the war's agony. Like Le Sèvre's clothing, her anguish cannot be taken off, nor can it be hidden or covered over, most especially by a wedding gown. Thank you. If you have a question or a comment for Lou Roberts, um, I can bring you a microphone. So just raise your hand and I will bring you a microphone if you have a question or a comment. Both of them. Don't. Um, I'm wondering to what extent women's identification with fashion and hence the idea that all things change actually makes them better suited to living through traumatic periods mm. than men who, you know, <laughs> they wear the same clothes for 40 years. <laughs> Well, that's an interesting comment, but I don't, I don't think I can answer it. <laughs> it's a very interesting comment. And also what you made me think when you said that was that fashion is constantly changing, too. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, yeah. so they're accustomed to that idea. Yeah. And it's just like, oh, right, skirts have gotten longer. It doesn't look good on me, but I got to do it because I got to do it. That's a great point. That's a great point. Thanks. That's great. Yeah. Here. You have to hold both of them. Um, I think I'd love to sort of complicate gender a little bit more okay. uh, by sort of introducing the notion um, as a professor at a military college, um, <laughs> how much the men are obsessed with uniforms <laughs> mm -hmm. and with the, all the um, ribbons and changes in uniform that they have. And um, again, sort of thinking again about them, very much thinking about themselves as, as ultra-masculine and yet taking on a kind of seemingly feminine role in uniform. And I wonder if the men of the Free French, as they gained their uniforms, talked about their ribbons and, and epaulettes as much as the women might have. Well, I don't know. Uh, sorry. I don't know if I can say as much because, you know, I haven't read a lot of male-resistant memoirs, but the ones I've read, I mean, the thing that got me that was so important was enumeration of the clothing. I've never seen that in a male-resistance memoir. Um, I actually also went to West Point recently, uh, so like the Citadel, you know, I was obsessed with what everyone was wearing, and what was really interesting to me was um, that the women all had the exact same hair. Uh, they all wore the same uniform as men. There's 18% of women uh, at West Point, and they all had very long hair, which they wore in buns. And um, so I tried to ask the department chair, you know, and he was like, clueless like he, he, he was like do they all wear buns I didn't notice that you know uh, but my my guess was that if they cut their hair short then they would be seen as lesbians so that that was just my guess about that so I I'm really fascinated with military uniforms now that's really interesting yeah thanks yeah. hi Thank you so much. It's so wonderful to hear you talk about clothing um, Thank you. as a dress historian. So I am um, with my colleague who's, who's not here tonight, but we have a seminar in Paris on dress history. And it is the seminar that Dominique Veillon began at the EHCP CNRS and that we've now taken over, the two of us. And at the last seminar, we had a woman 
Jane Obai, who, uh, who was um, uh, 12, 14 years old uh, during the war and who wrote 40 journals, uh, private diaries um, of her, you know, day to day, dear diary, this is how I spent my day. And, and she came to speak at the seminar and Dominique was there. Um, and uh, Philippe Lejeune, who writes on, on autobiography, came and the, the three spoke about, uh, so Jane in her diaries cuts out pictures from magazines and, um, and, and has little notes and says, this is, you know, I admire, I like this hat, I wish I could wear this hat. So my question was, have you seen, how did other women think about the resistance dress? And is there... Uh, yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So, so like in the way or not in the resistance, what they right about exactly. Them. So the way that Jane would cut out pictures, right? So I was trying to think, you know, was she cutting out pictures of resistance to say and and saying, oh, uh, you know, I, I I wish I could pick up a gun and put shorts on and. That's a really great question. I actually think it would probably have to wait for the liberation almost mm. because these women were clandestines. So it was only at the liberation when you have something like Seguin who's really like fashioning herself as a, as a, you know, as a warrior. Um, and remember that the Maquis women who did this, they, they lived in the woods. So it was hard to, you know, the villagers wouldn't have seen them. But it's a really interesting question. I, I can't answer it. I've never been... Yeah, I see. at the liberation, it would be the moment, especially exactly. with everything else that's going on at that time. So um, I just know Seguin was completely romanticized. Mm. Uh, but I think that had less to do with, her, with anything other than the fact that she looked like a spontaneous fighter. Do you know what I mean? She looked like she'd gotten up that morning and then put a red sash on and went off to you know, fight the revolution. So she became this symbol of spontaneity for the press, for everyone. Um, the sort of heroic of the liberation. Um, but other than that... But were women dr dressing up as, you know? Yeah, exactly, yeah. But other than that, I mean, in the, in, during the war, they could not in any way look different. Right. You know, the whole idea was to look as discreet as possible, except women who were specifically in urban areas and dealing with Germans trying to get through checkpoints and stuff like that. So, it's a great question. Sorry, I can't answer. So I have two questions. One is, you've, uh, it seems like your main source of the memoirs of, of these um, yes, women that's resistance right. fighters. Yep. So I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what, what were these women thinking when they joined? The, like, what do they think about their motivation for joining the resistance? Do they see themselves, I mean, is it pure sort of patriotic, mm. you know, ritualistic language that you would expect to see? Or is there something particular gendered about what they say. And then my second question has to do with, I'm comparing the two, some of the language from World War I, where, you know, and I, I, I worked on, I worked a while ago on nurses, and they were so resistant to that coquette image, and they were, you know, the women were so insistent that that wasn't who they were, and that was giving them a bad name, and they were professionals, and da 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 So it's interesting that there's more of an embrace, or maybe a tactical embrace of that kind of coquette image here, and I'm wondering whether you see that kind of pushback that in World War I was, seemed so prominent. Yeah. Um, okay, so the first question, a variety of reasons. You know, it's hard to generalize. Um, some women, yes, I would say patriotism was really important, a, a sense of adventure. Um, and then also, like, family. You know, if, a whole fa if your family was in the resistance, you were going to be in the resistance, too. And Shaming is a perfect example of that. Her whole family was in the resistance. Um, and then the second question, right, um, I, I didn't see any defiance about not being a coquette. I think because what's different about the Second World War is that that, as I say, coquetry became a war strategy. Mm -hmm. And so it was respected because that was how Allied servicemen got through the lines. That's, you know what I mean? So I think that there was uh, a strategic reiteration of that which prevented its sort of condemnation by women. I think they were much more out to use coquetry than to condemn it. Mm, interesting. Yeah. All right. All right. Please join me in thanking you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. <laughs>